Welcome back. This is the latter half of the material on litigating surveillance, and it deals with constitutional issues. There are three topics that I would like to address. First, sovereign immunity. It's a constitutional doctrine lurking in the background of all surveillance challenges, so we'll take it head on. Second, claims for constitutional prospective relief. The rules there are pretty straightforward. Last, we'll work through constitutional damages claims. The rules there are, well, not straightforward at all. Okay, so let's start with sovereign immunity. The Supreme Court has crafted a doctrine of sovereign immunity, locating it sometimes in the structure of the Constitution and sometimes in the Eleventh Amendment. While the historical basis of sovereign immunity is fascinating and could fill volumes, let's cut to the chase. How sovereign immunity impacts surveillance litigation. It's important to distinguish the various parties that might be sued over government surveillance. There are, roughly, three categories, with differing implications for sovereign immunity. The first category is the government. That includes the federal government, the state government, but not local governments, and all of the federal and state agencies. The entities in this category are immune from suit as sovereigns. A plaintiff can't get anything unless that immunity has been waived or abrogated. For our purposes, there are three exceptions to note. The United States has expressly waived sovereign immunity under the Administrative Procedure Act, the Federal Tort Claims Act, and the USA Patriot Act. Outside of those areas, a suit against the United States is no good. As for the states, many have enacted waivers of sovereign immunity that parallel the APA and the FTCA. The details vary by state. All right, so there's the bad news for plaintiffs. Now let's turn to the better news. A plaintiff can also sue individual government officers, all the way up to the President of the United States. One way those officers can be sued is in their official capacity. That is, they can be sued as the current holder of a specific government office. One key benefit of suing in this way is that if the holder of that office changes, the new officer is automatically substituted. So, for example, if you've sued the president and the new president is elected, then the new president is just swapped into the lawsuit. You don't need to start from scratch. The other key benefit of official capacity litigation is that prospective relief binds the office, not just the particular officer. Future office holders have to abide by court orders. Under the Constitution, a government officer sued in their official capacity, is immune from damages. They are not, however, immune from prospective relief. A plaintiff can still seek an injunction and can still seek a declaration of rights. That distinction arises from Ex parte Young, a case from over a century ago, which is still good law. So, official capacity claims are a critical tool for challenging ongoing surveillance programs. The final category of defendant that you should be aware of is a government officer sued in their individual capacity. In other words, sued as a private person. This seemingly minor formality has important impacts. Unlike an official capacity suit, there is no automatic substitution and there is no binding relief on the office. However, there is a tremendous benefit for plaintiffs. There is no state sovereign immunity defense. A plaintiff can seek damages for past misconduct. For that reason, when challenging past instances of surveillance, individual capacity suits are a go-to tool. All right, that's the mess that is sovereign immunity. Now on to prospective relief for constitutional violations. You may be wondering to yourself, self, where's the cause of action for a constitutional violation? 
for purposes of injunctive relief, the courts have long assumed that there is a cause of action against officers in their official capacity. That cause of action is implicit in the Constitution. Ex parte Young is sometimes cited as the authority for a cause of action against state officers. Reasonable minds disagree on that point. So that's it for constitutional perspective relief. It exists, and plaintiffs can sue for it. Now on to the much more complicated topic of constitutional damages. You once again might be wondering, where's the cause of action? Let's start with federal officers. There is no federal statute that provides a cause of action against a federal employee who violates a person's constitutional rights. The courts have, however, recognized an implied damages cause of action in the Constitution. The seminal case in this area is Bivens against six unknown named agents of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, or Bivens for short. These are called Bivens claims. The doctrine surrounding when a Bivens claim is available is quite complicated, especially since this area of law has fallen into disfavor with a majority of the Supreme Court. For our purposes, it is reasonably well established that law enforcement violations of the Fourth Amendment are actionable under Bivens. The damages cause of action against state officers is very different. A federal statute does expressly establish liability. That's 42 U.S.C. Section 1983, usually just called Section 1983. So, there is always a damages cause of action available against state officers. I would add that 1983 also allows for prospective relief, much like Young, and it also allows recovery of attorney fees and litigation costs. Finally, Section 1983 can be used against local agencies, such as police departments. When a plaintiff brings a Bivens or Section 1983 claim against an individual, there is a critical defense that they must overcome. It's called qualified immunity. The name means what it says. It's a conditional immunity from damages lawsuits. The doctrine of qualified immunity limits damages liability to clearly established constitutional rights. If a reasonable person in the defendant's position would not have known that they were violating the Constitution, then the lawsuit's over. The net effect is that government officers get a freebie. The first time a novel constitutional violation reaches the courts, officers can claim qualified immunity. It isn't until the second time that they might be liable for damages. Let me very briefly touch on criminal liability. It is not inherently criminal to violate the Constitution. There are federal statutes that provide criminal liability for constitutional violations, but those statutes also include qualified immunity. So when you hear a claim like the FBI or the NSA are criminals, make sure to think through qualified immunity first. Especially where a judge has signed off, criminal liability is quite unlikely. You might be wondering how individual government employees are supposed to fork over piles of cash. So let me clear that up. Officers don't actually pay out damages themselves. In the overwhelming majority of cases, a government agency foots the bill. In the legalese, the officer is indemnified. As a legal formality, though, damages suits are still against the officers as private individuals. The very last point I'd like to make about constitutional damages liability is a special requirement when suing a local government under Section 1983. A plaintiff has to show that conduct arose from a government policy or custom. So, for surveillance purposes, a plaintiff can't sue a local law enforcement agency over an individual officer's misconduct, 
the plaintiff has to show an agency policy or custom of using that particular surveillance practice. All right, that's the story on damages. And that concludes what I wanted to cover about constitutional issues. Thanks for sticking through the dry material. In the next part of the course, we're going to get into the basic mechanics of surveillance law. We're going to start with telephone snooping, then we'll move on to modern information technology.